Hey, my dear menopausal friends. <laughs> Welcome to Menopause University, where we discuss all things pertaining to menopause. This is video number 320, and it's the very first video in the unit on uterine cancer. I cover everything in a logical, stepwise manner so that all you have to do if you want to understand everything is watch my videos in order. So I hope this is the first video you watch in this unit. As always, I start at the beginning, assuming you know nothing. And this video will address the basic anatomy of your uterus and how it changes if you get uterine cancer. This video is important because it will lay the foundation for all the other videos on uterine cancer. And I'll refer back to it often. You're going to kick yourself if I refer to it and you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I probably sound like your mother, don't I? <laughs> but that's okay, you know, mom was usually right, wasn't she? <laughs> okay, in my book, both the first and the second editions, all of chapter 31 is on uterine cancer. But as usual, I will go into much more detail in these videos. Today's material is at the very beginning of the uterine cancer chapter in a section entitled Anatomy. Since we're just getting started, and since this will set the stage for everything that follows, let's test your knowledge of some basics with a quiz question. Which of the following is true regarding the origin of uterine cancer as it pertains specifically to menopause. A. It refers to cancer in the muscular portion of the uterus. B. It refers to cancer in the glandular portion of the uterus. C. It refers to cancer in the uterus and cervix. D. It refers to cancer in the uterus, cervix, and fallopian tubes. E, it refers to cancer in the uterus, cervix, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. F, A and B above. G, A, B, and C above. H, A, B, and D above. And I, A, B, and E above. Was that super simple? Or does it make you aware of the fact that you may not know as much as you think you know? That's what's so great about quiz questions. They reveal what you don't know. So here's the quiz question again with the answer in bold. It refers to cancer in the glandular portion of the uterus. And with that, we'll get started with some anatomy. Way back in video seven, on the basic anatomy of your reproductive tract, I used fruit, nuts, and vegetables to demonstrate the different anatomical structures that make up your reproductive tract. And I'll start there again because I want you to be absolutely sure you know precisely what part of it we're addressing when we talk about uterine cancer. And likewise, I want you to be absolutely sure you know which parts we are not addressing when we talk about uterine cancer. You might be rolling your eyes right now, but believe me, if I do not make these distinctions clear from the start, you and a whole lot of other women will get very confused. I know that anatomy isn't most people's cup of tea, so despite the fact that you've heard the names of various anatomical structures, you don't necessarily know precisely where they are or what they do. Or you may not know where one begins and the other one ends. But these are very critical matters when it comes to cancer. So bear with me as I delineate the parameters of our topic on uterine cancer. So the anatomy of your reproductive tract consists of just four structures. Your uterus, your cervix, your fallopian tubes, and your ovaries. 
So here, on this chopping board, I have an avocado, two string beans, and two walnuts. The avocado represents two of the four structures. It encompasses your uterus and your cervix. The string beans represent your fallopian tubes, and the walnuts represent your ovaries. Of these, the only one we're addressing with regard to uterine cancer is the avocado. So I'll discard the others for now. So that leaves us with this. But as you learned in video 7 on anatomy, and also in videos 8 and 132 on total hysterectomy, your total uterus actually consists of two structures. Your uterus in the top portion and your cervix in the bottom portion. Well, in a discussion of uterine cancer, we are only addressing your uterus, which is this top portion. So let's discard the cervix for now. So that leaves us now with two pieces. And now we're down to the anatomy of concern. But wait, there's more. Back in video seven, I taught you that your uterus is really mostly a muscle. And the muscular part of your uterus is the outermost portion of your uterus, this outside part. The muscular part does what any other muscle does. It contracts, it stretches, and it relaxes. But the inside of your uterus has only one function. It's a baby carriage. Throughout your reproductive life, it forms a thick cushion each month to house a fetus if you get pregnant. This thick layer of cells cushions a developing fetus during a nine-month pregnancy. But if you don't get pregnant, this thick layer of cells sheds because there's no baby to cushion. So you end up with this. So throughout your reproductive life, this inner lining in your uterus goes from thick to thin, from thick to thin, over and over again. Now, how and why does it do that? It does that because the cells lining the inside of your uterus are glandular cells. These glandular cells make a great cushion for a developing fetus because they are really, really, really cushy. So, they're arranged along the lining of your uterus in up right columns like this. So they are very deep. If this is the base of your uterus, they are like this. So if you put them on the uterus, be, they would be in this orientation, okay? Essentially, they are rectangular shaped, cushy cells that stand on the short side of a rectangle. And this makes for a mighty fine cushion for a baby. Now, the medical name for these cells that resemble columns is, go figure, columnar cells. And the descriptive medical term for all glandular cells is adenomatous. All adenomatous cells respond to hormones or produce hormones. They are all equipped with the ability to function as a gland. In the case of your inner uterine lining, the columnar adenomatous cells respond to estrogen and progesterone. And estrogen is like 
fertilizer for the glandular cells lining your uterus. It makes the glands grow, just like fertilizer makes the grass grow. So estrogen serves to create the cushion for a potential pregnancy, and estrogen is what, the, what makes the columnar adenomatous cells thick and cushy, really thick and cushy. Now, progesterone has two jobs, and which one it does depends entirely on whether or not you get pregnant. If you do get pregnant, progesterone keeps the columnar glandular cells thick and cushy to protect the fetus throughout the pregnancy. Remember, I told you long ago in video 9 that progesterone is the baby's hormone. It was never there for you, and the only reason you produce progesterone is to protect a pregnancy. So progesterone really only has a job to do if you get pregnant. And in the case of pregnancy, this thick cushion is a really good thing. But if you don't get pregnant, progesterone has nothing to do. It serves no purpose. So it plummets and disappears. And when it disappears, it serves the function of making all those fertilized glands that used to be like the grass slough in the form of a period. So the loss of progesterone basically mows the grass. It's just like a lawnmower that mows the grass. So you can think of estrogen as the fertilizer and progesterone as the lawnmower. Estrogen causes the inner lining of the uterus to do this, whereas progesterone causes the inner lining of your uterus to do this. So the thick cushion that was good for your baby is no good for you. This means that the thick and thin of your inner uterine lining is due to the fertilizing and mowing functions of estrogen and progesterone. Now, when you become postmenopausal, you lose your estrogen and progesterone. Without estrogen and progesterone, these glandular cells of your inner uterine lining no longer have anything to stimulate them. So they shrivel up. The medical term for shriveling up is atrophy. Atrophy of the inner lining of your uterus is the cessation of its response to the stimulation from estrogen and progesterone. Atrophy is akin to muscles that dry up and shrink as a result of becoming inactive. So these thick, cushy, columnar glandular cells transform into these thin, hard, inactive glandular cells. Big, big difference. So endometrial atrophy is your body's way of permanently getting rid of the thick cushion that was good for your baby, but is bad for you. And it does this by making the glandular cells in your uterus become inactive. Inactivity is the same thing as lack of stimulation. So just as an unused muscle atrophies when not stimulated by exercise, the inner lining of your uterus atrophies when it is not stimulated by estrogen and progesterone. So when it comes to our topic of uterine cancer, the part of your uterus that pertains specifically to uterine cancer in menopause is this inner uterine lining. That's all. The uterine cancer of concern is cancer that starts in these glandular columnar cells that normally form a cushion for a fetus and respond to estrogen and progesterone. We are not talking about cancers that develop in the outer muscle of your uterus out here. And we are not talking about cancers that develop in your cervix. All we care 
care about is the inner lining. And the inner lining of your uterus actually has a much more medical sounding term than inner lining. <laughs> the official name for it is endometrium. As with so many medical terms, the word endometrium consists of two different root words. Endo means inner, metrium means uterus. So your endometrium is the inner lining of your uterus. And the cancer we are addressing in this unit on uterine cancer is endometrial uterine cancer. It's cancer that starts in these glandular columnar cells inside your uterus that respond to estrogen and progesterone. Sometimes we have complicated words in medicine, but they always consist of multiple words or word roots that we've just combined. And you'll see that with a lot of cancer. In the case of endometrial uterine cancer, the word that describes the kind of cancer that results from stimulation of the columnar glandular cells in your uterine lining is adenocarcinoma. This is a combination of the word adenomatous, meaning columnar glandular cell, plus the word carcinoma, which means cancer. So adenocarcinoma is cancer of the columnar glandular cells lining the inside of your uterus. And it's the kind of cancer that arises from the glandular cells of your endometrial lining. Back in video number 312 on common characteristics of all cancers, I taught you that every cancer begins as just one single cell that transforms from a normal cell into a cancer cell. So the kind of cell that we'll be focusing on in this unit on endometrial uterine cancer is a columnar glandular endometrial cell that responds to estrogen and progesterone. So the entire remainder of this unit will focus specifically on endometrial uterine cancer. But even though we've narrowed our focus all the way down to the very kind of cell that starts the uterine cancer of concern at menopause. You need to be aware that there are many other cells in your uterus that can transform into other kinds of uterine cancer. Some of those are also part of the endometrial lining and others are not. So do not assume that all uterine cancers are the same. There are even other endometrial cancers that are not of the, of the variety that concerns us for purposes of menopause. So what I've done today is designate our specific focus in this chapter on endometrial uterine cancer. And here's how we've gotten there. We've designated your uterus as one of the four parts of your reproductive tract. And your uterus consists of only your uterus and your cervix. But we only care about your uterus. So, and your uterus has an outer muscle and an inner lining. And we only care about the inner lining. It's the cushion that was once good for your baby, but has become bad for you. So I guess cushions can be good or bad depending on where they are and how long they last. And the cells in your endometrial lining that are the focus of our topic are these columnar glandular cells that respond to estrogen and progesterone. I just wanted to orient you to the topic at hand before giving you all the information about how common endometrial cancer is. So now that you know precisely which anatomical part is involved in our uterine cancer unit, we'll discuss incidence and prevalence next week. I'm going to bet that you'll never look at an avocado the same way again. <laughs> I hope I haven't ruined them for you. I love them. I eat an avocado almost every day. <laughs> Go to menopausetaylor.me to schedule a consultation with me. You probably need one even if you think you don't. <laughs> and if you do have a consultation with me, You'll be forever glad you did. 
Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to both my newsletter and this YouTube channel before you go today. <laughs> okay, bye now. Ha, ha, ha.